on a Zoom call here with, um, with Ed Saltis, who many of you would know from the string of boats known as Midnight Rambler. Um, he's agreed to talk to us today, um, not so much about the current racing, but more about uh, his history in offshore racing and how things have changed. So welcome, Ed. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Um, I thought we might just dive in right at the beginning, right at the start. And um, I read that you did your first Sydney Hobart when you were 17 years old, which of course today isn't possible. Uh, tell us uh, what the feeling was heading out of Sydney Heads as a 17 year old. I'm guessing that's around what, 78, something like that? Uh, 1979 was my first race, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, which boat uh, were you on? Uh, I was on Mel Temi, which is um, which was my father's boat, Bill Salter, Salty Bill, as they used to call him. He's still alive, Dad. 94 years old now, but uh, back in the day, he commissioned the S&S 44, Sparkman Stevens 44, and she was a great, uh, very similar to, to Love and War. In fact, Love and War was the next generation after Mel Temi, and uh, beautiful sea boats, the S&S uh, uh, masthead, big, powerful masthead boats. They were great boats to go to sea in. So, yeah, I was very excited as a young kid uh, and scared. Um, you know, about Bass Strait and uh, the, the usual horror stories of the Sydney Hobart. Uh, the first night we had a bit of a dust up, probably 25, 30 knots, which is bad enough. Uh, and uh, the usual thing set against wind. So it was a nasty night, but uh, the boat loved it. Um, as indeed Love and War loved just this most recent Sydney Hobart race, when on the first night it blew very similar and uh, she handled it very well. So yeah, it was a great boat to do it on first up. And with my father as well, uh, I did my first three Hobart races with Dad, and uh, he taught me a lot of uh, seamanship type lessons that you can't read in textbooks. You have to be out there doing it. And I, I hope I've, I've managed to maintain his influence through all these years since. Um, and I also read that it must have been before Mel Tammy, he owned a boat called Lasso Lass, is that right? Yes, so that, yes, that's, that's a, right. And that, that's a that's, Jock Muir that, boat, isn't it? Yeah, very, you've done your research. I was going to, yes, that's very much in the heart of the uh, wooden boat enthusiast. So Jock Muir built in Hobart, uh, the Lass of Lass, uh, beautiful boat she was, uh, built in his backyard. In fact, I think it was the first boat he built in his backyard because the shed wasn't big enough or at Battery Point or whatever the reasons were. But uh, yes, I was just a kid, uh, oh gee, from about five years to 11 years old when, when Dad had the Lass. I can remember many, uh, pit water trips from Sydney to pit water and you know, rafting up with other young you know, families up there. Fantastic uh, school holidays on this on this beautiful boat. Dad changed it to a yawl. Uh, she was a sloop. He changed it to a yawl. I don't know whether it worked or not. I did, never did ask Dad about that. But uh, so she was faster reaching. She could put up all these extra mizzen sails reaching. Uh, but I'm not sure that it really did much good in the end. But anyway, that's that's, that's one change that we made. Interestingly <laughs> enough, my um, my Boat, my wooden boat is a is a Philip Rhodes design from the 1950s, and it was designed as a yawl. And somebody made it a sloop. And I'm always thinking, I want to put it back to being a yawl. So <laughs> I haven't got around to it yet, but I'm thinking. Yeah. Go for um, it. Did you realise Lassa Lass is for sale at the moment? Did you know that? Yes. Yeah, I do, and she's in really good condition as well. Um, mm. Gee, if I had enough money, I'd, I'd buy it. <laughs> but uh, I was oh, just, look. I was just <laughs> sowing the seed, you know. Like, yeah, I think, yeah. I think hey, she's the other boat that's for sale that you might be aware of is uh, Mel Temi. Yes, oh, really? For sale. She's she's uh, moored in uh, Ulladulla these days, which is a strange place for a for, for a oh. large yacht to be moored. Also in good condition. Both owners luckily have looked after the boat, so they so they're both in good nick. Right, right. Um, because um, last to last, I think they. <laughs> I think the list price is only something like 90 grand or something, which, you know, is a lot of money for an old boat. I understand that. But then mm. I also look at it the other way and say, you get a lot of boat for 90 grand. <laughs> <laughs> you sure do. And she's certainly part of history. Dad did several Hobarts. She did a few Hobarts under the original owner. I know Jock Muir sailed her to Sydney for the original owner, whose name I forget, but Dad bought her off the original owner and did, I think, four or five, maybe six Hobarts on, on the last. So she's certainly done, done some hard yards. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Um, and, you know, you owned and sailed in recent years, you know, pretty much state-of-the-art racing machines. I mean, is the thrill for you winning or is it 
the actual experience of sailing or is it going fast? Or I mean, because when you look back to those boats, I mean, you know, obviously they're not planing boats, they're pushing a lot of water along as they go, which is a different experience from today. I mean, what, what is it that makes you come back? Is it the search? I mean, you've already won the race once. So, you know, what, what you feel it is that drives you back to it? Oh, look, I'd, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I was out there to, to do very well. Uh, well. Winning the race is extremely hard, but that's always the, the distant goal, or at least to win your division these days. So it's about taking on the best, often the best in the world, and hopefully uh, accounting ourselves well against very good sailors. So, so the competitive thing is there, but it's more than just that. It's about going sailing with your mates and people that you enjoy um, being with and going through hard times with and uh, celebrating with post the race. So as I've got older, it's more about the journey. Yes, it's about getting the boat ready and going as hard as we can, but it's it's about just uh, mucking around on boats with mates, I suppose. It's, I just enjoy doing it. Um, and I suppose that sort of leads on to a question that I've sort of had in my mind. I sort of know Bruce Taylor down here and talked to him about um, this sort of thing. I mean, are the days of sort of enthusiastic amateurs are they disappearing i mean bruce you know is, i think he's come second three times or something and you know he's done it off his own bat and had a string of foot spars and i you know i'm guessing you're in the same sort of mold yes. as that in that you're doing it off your own bat and when you know professional crews flying out and then flying sorry flying in and flying out before the you know the the rest of the boats arrive and all that sort of thing is that sort of slightly disappointing for you when you sort of see that yeah, it is disappointing. I, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I've always only had amateur crew. I will never pay someone to come racing with me. I'd rather do it off my own bat than pay some other bugger to win the race for me. <laughs> uh, and, and Bruce, I know, is uh, the same way, but it's getting harder and harder. The racing scene now in Sydney especially is hugely professional. Um, most of the top boats have you know, one or two or more paid hands and very good sailors they are. Um, the fly in, fly out brigade, yes. So it's lost a bit of its look. There's there's still the Corinthian part of the fleet, the Bruce Taylors and I, and and many others who still maintain that that older flavour to the race. <clears throat> but the it it's the the Sydney Hobart has lost a lot of its uh, charm, I suppose you could say. Post the race in the old days, all the boats would stay down there, all the crew would stay down there. You could have a beer with a a maxi crew or a half ton crew and we're all just you know mates have done the Hobart race. Now the um, <clears throat> the heavies as I call them fly out straight away before we even arrive. Half the boats are packed up and sailing at home. Um, so there's still a party in Hobart but it's only for the for the amateurs that are left uh, which is a shame but look that, that's how the world's gone. Most sports have been corrupted by money and sailing has also been corrupted by money as a fact of life. Yeah yeah um I love the fact that you say, you know, I'm guessing as you get older that it does become more about the people than the actual, than the boat and going fast, that that becomes more important. Um, do you think, I'd like to just sort of get a take on sort of the way that the atmosphere on board your boat would have changed in those 30 years. I mean, when I started ocean racing, which was only in the 80s, sort of late 80s, even then, it was a pretty sort of macho, sort of aggressive sort of vibe on board a lot of the boats that a lot of people were, you know, um, I, I guess behaving in a way that wouldn't really be seen as acceptable today. Do you think yeah. that that's a, do you think, um, I mean, in a sense, that's, a, well, in, in a lot of ways, that's a really good thing that it's not like that. I mean, how do you, have you managed the sort of change in expectations of how sailors are meant to behave on, on the boat and off the boat as well? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd be lying if I didn't say we uh, played up and drank too much in Hobart because that still happens, but but, uh, but ho hopefully within limits of responsibility. Uh, but no, look, seriously, uh, yeah, I've seen big change there. Back in the day, it was just a bloke sport and it was a very blokey thing. Uh, and there was sexism in that, I, I suppose, was was uh, ingrained into it. Um, I've, I've had uh, women on my cruise over the years. The first was... Uh, fantastic tough young Scottish lady called Sam who was on the far 40 midnight round but pretty tough boat very hard fast boat but very tough boat to sail and gee she was good she never once complained she did everything she was actually asked to do and was a, a real asset to the boat that was back in about 2008 
and recently, um, just last year, I had uh, on my crew was uh, young Anne Annie Stewart, who's a, who, who comes from Hobart. She's only twenty years old now. She does the pit, does it extremely well, um, and she's there not because she's a woman. She's there because she's good enough, and and it doesn't concern me whether you're male or female. You just have to be good enough and be able to blend in well with the crew and take the hard stuff and tick, tick, tick for all that. So I've seen big changes there and changes for the better. You know, we aren't, we aren't uh, taking it easy. We, get, we, we, we go just as hard, but um, happy, very happy to have Anne aboard. Yeah, fantastic. No, that's great. It's really good to hear that somebody, you know, at the pointy end of the ocean racing is thinking like that because, because I think it's really important for the sort of longevity of the sport that we are like that. Um, I was sort of looking through the list of boats that um, have carried the name Midnight Rambler and the, it's quite an interesting mix of designers there. Like you move from designer to designer, you know, when a lot of people have a loyalty to a designer and they think that they're <laughs> going to, you know, they're going to produce the winner for them. So I'm thinking the one that you won on it was a Robert Hick, right? The old Australian design, yeah, which was yeah, great. from Melbourne, um, yeah. the Far 40 and then the Kerr and now Sydney 36. So, I mean, how do you, what's your thinking when you're thinking it's time for a, a new boat? How, are you trying to find a, a, like a bit of a loop, not a loophole, but a soft spot in the rules where you might be able to get a bit of a, get a bit of, bit of a head start or what's your thinking? Yeah, that's probably for, foremost in, in my mind. And when I say uh, me, uh, this current boat I own on my own, but the other, six or seven boats, whatever it was, uh, I've, I've owned with, with partners, Bob Thomas and Michael Benzik have been very important. So it's been us together because we all can't afford it individually, but we can afford it by pooling our resources. So my partners and I had just that discussion, what boat, what designer on the scene seems to be designing competitive boats under IOR or IMS or IRC, as the different rules have come and gone. <laughs> um, and, and Kerr was, uh, was and is a very good designer under IRC. Um, as an uh, Englishman, he's always been very close to the IRC rule, understands as best he can with IRC because it's meant to be secret, but um, what, what makes a boat competitive and fast without, you know, with, with, a, with a competitive rating. So certainly it's based on uh, designers that seem to have a good handle on uh, the rule. Um, the current boat, um, uh, Sydney 36 um, yeah. is uh, a, a, a different designer again. <clears throat> uh, Murray Burns Duval, I, I think it was Duval really was the main guy that designed the boat. The other guys were on the side, in my view. Um, and he's a very good designer. Uh, she was also designed originally for IMS, but then changed. And this is one of the latest Sydney 36 that changed to be more competitive under IRC. And there's things that you can do that I found it, you know, that I've gradually learned as a, a punter that designers can do to make the boat more competitive under various rating rules. So this boat does rate well under IRC and, and it, it's all about beating your rating. You just gotta, it's not about beating the boat next to you. You just gotta beat your own rating. And if you can do that, then you're probably gonna beat the guy next to you. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hope that answered your question. It, it's sort of like Sid Fisher, who's always been my hero. He, he jumped around a bit too. He had the, the famous original ragamuffin was S&S. &S. Yep. And then uh, Bob Miller or Ben Lexon uh, designed some fantastic boats, Ginkgo and Apollo 2, way mm. back in 1973. This is going back a long way. They almost beat the world. I think the Germans beat them in the Admiral's Cup, but they were superb boats. So uh, Sid Fisher then went to Bob Miller to design him a 54-foot boat, which turned out to be a duck. So he didn't, didn't stay with Miller anymore. Which one was that called? Down. What was that uh, it, it was called uh, Ragamuffin, yeah. All oh, right. Okay. It was his second, his second Ragamuffin. In fact, it's not very well done, known, but it was a real lemon. Uh, right. I don't want to criticise Lex. He's a fantastic designer. He's done, done some great boats, but um, uh, Fisher was quoted as saying, "It's like having a uh, having having a Rolls having a mini mine. Uh, what did he say? Having a a Rolls Royce engine in, in a mini miner." So it had this huge rig, but not enough, you know, form and stability to right. handle right. the huge rig. Um, then he went to Frears, German Frears after that. And then he went to Peterson after that. And then Peterson again, and then Far. So, so he jumped around a lot as well with his various boats. 
Yeah. So I'm sort of looking through your list. If you include, if you include Mel Tammy, it's S and S, and then you had a Steinman boat, didn't you? Mel Steinman, yeah. A, a yeah. little uh, half tonne of Courtney Zulu, which we were crazy to go to Hobart on, frankly. Yeah. She weighed about 2.1 tonnes. She had a, had a maximum positive stability, if, if you know this technical stuff, of 105 yeah. degrees. Currently, the maximum stability is 115 degrees or more to do the Hobart. Yeah. So this boat would fall over if you didn't have oh, six okay. Sydney bars and Sydney on the rail. And we did five Hobarts on this thing. Pulled out only one and got there at rest. Almost won it in 91. A uh, very tough boat to sail on, but I was only 28 at the time. I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof, or, or yeah, thought right. I was. And yeah. we had some fun. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Um, and a, a subject that interests me a little bit, is, I mean, it interests everybody, I suppose, is safety. Um, you know, I, I sort of take safety very seriously, but I do sometimes I'm concerned about, you know, I noticed one of the first things you said in this interview is when you went out with your dad the first time, he taught you, I guess, I'm not sure what the word you used was, but seamanship, seamanship. really what yeah. we're talking about. You know, not necessarily the rules to obey, but the way to do things safely. And I sometimes worry that the current sort of regime of, you know, what you need to be cat one and all the things you need to do to comply actually sort of abrogate the responsibility off the person into ticking a box. Um, and that sort of might make things a little less safe rather than safer. Is, it, is that something mm -hmm. that you might, you know, sort of partially agree with? Yeah, I do agree. You've, you've actually hit a hot button with me and, and you, you, what you said then puts it very well. And my, my father, who I, as, you can, as is obvious, I respect greatly for his ocean racing feats. He said it, I'll try to get his words right. He, he's, he said he, he doesn't agree with all this safety emphasis and all the stuff you've got to have. Not because it's bad stuff. Yes, you can make an argument that it's all going to minimise marginally your your uh, uh, your you know chances of um, getting hurt badly. But he said it's it's falsely wrapping young sailors in cotton wool and making them feel safe when they aren't safe. So a young sailor has all this PLB and PFD and SSSC and all this radio stuff and all the other stuff you've got to put on board. And thinks, oh, okay. Therefore, I can do the Hobart race, no problem, and I'll be, I'll be safe. I would say that it would reduce your chances of serious injury or death by twenty percent. The other eighty percent is seamanship. And my big beef, and I've said it to the CYC and others, and I don't know if they listen or not, but okay, that twenty percent is important. But what's more important is the eighty percent. And we should be teaching young sailors, or any sailor, me included. We all need to keep doing this how to go to sea when it's a tough night and handle the boat with your crew. And there's rules because lawyers and the insurance companies seem to rule our lives these days that races can't be started if it's playing more than 30 knots. That's one of the rules at the CYC, I know. Yeah. So that's all very well. Then, then we go off into Bass Strait where it's playing 60 knots well, in really dangerous conditions and we, without having had that experience before. Mm. So look, I'm not saying the safety is bad, but to give this false sense of security wrapped in cotton wool, it ain't the case. You, know, you have to look after yourself, no matter how much of this shit you got, pardon the, pardon the French, you've got to look after yourself and your crew. And that comes with getting out there and doing it when it's a tough day or night. Uh, you, you, I mean, it obviously is something that resonates with you, but it certainly resonates with me. We have races cancelled down here when it's blowing 25 knots on the bay. That's not even in the ocean, you know, like, and there's, and, there's boats that sail every weekend that have never put a reef in, you know? Yes. Because yeah. they can handle it up to 22 knots without a reef. And after that, the race gets cancelled. So, you know, and then they go and do this racing. So um, I, I'm not sure what the answer is because, as I say, I'm a, I'm a big fan of safety. I don't want anybody on my boat ever to get hurt or killed or anything like yep, that. So but, um, yep. but but the way we do it is 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 maybe needs a bit of thinking about. Um Finally, we, I'm nearly done because I've really, I've really enjoyed talking. Ah, about it. Um, that's good. <laughs> but but I, I do have one more question. I, you know, obviously I'm involved with wooden boats and slow old boats and, and you know, you're into racing and going fast and that sort of thing. A lot of famous sailors and successful sailors, as they get older, actually revert to having, to going slower and, and more enjoying the... Um, I guess the sort of tradition and the and, and the 
the sort of craft of sailing rather than the racing. I mean, examples of that, I mean, even like people like Dennis Connor bought a, a Q class, you know, and, um, mm. you know, lot, lots of people sort of revert to that. Sure, Sean Langman, another famous Sean one. Langman, Sean exactly. Maluka. Sean, you know, with Maluka and also with his project with um, with uh, Morna, I suppose, and those sort mm. of things as well. Um, what is it, do you think, that people are trying to go back to when they do that? And I'm not saying you should or will or anything like that, but there must be in the back of your mind that sort of respect for the history of the thing. And I think a lot of people embrace that as they get older and, and move on. Yeah. Yeah, look, it's strange you should mention that. And I, uh, uh, I'm close, very close to the owners of uh, Solveig. I hope oh, yeah. I pronounced uh, that Annie, Annie, and, Annie, and, uh, uh, and, Annie and Jono, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So Jono we did, did a story uh, on them just before they tried to do the first one that got cancelled. We wrote a, a piece on them. They were great, really helpful. I'll put oh, a link yeah, on great. this. Yes, yeah. And uh, uh, so Jono, just out of um, history, he did all those races with me on New Zulu, the little Steinman boat. So he was as crazy as I was. He was about 25 at the time. Then did, he had done about probably 15 Hobart races with me over the years on different boats. So we're very, very close, he and I. Anyway, long story short, when, when Solberg came in on, on the 1st of January last year <laughs> uh, with a lovely sea breeze, you know, it, was, it was an early sea breeze, had the spinnaker up down the Derwent River. I was out there cheering them on at 7.30 in the morning. And I, I really had a tear in my eye. It was just, it was history in the making. When you when you consider Solberg and the three Halverson brothers and the other greats that sailed on that boat, won the Hobart race on handicap and line honours too, I mm. think. Mm. Uh, this was, it was just history. And, and they've turned this fairly um, tired looking old girl into a beautiful, into her original appearance again, without putting on too much modern stuff. It, it, it's still the original boat. And she looked fantastic. Uh, uh, this is a bit of a scoop, but Jono and Annie are, are probably, I'm talking out of line here, but they're hoping to come down and do the Wooden Boat Festival here in Tassie. And uh, John's already put it to me, would I like to do the delivery down from Sydney to Hobart on uh, Solbeck? And I haven't said yes, but I certainly haven't said no. It would be uh, a huge thing. Uh, you know, my, my old man, uh, the Halbersons were my father's hero. You know, that, yeah. that's how great they were. Um, and to be on a boat that, that they sailed on, yeah, it, it means a lot. So it's not about getting there fast. It's about pulling into the different ports and having a bit of fun and uh, mm. with, with your mates, bucking around on boats with your mates. It's, uh, well, originally, the, the Sydney Hobart was planned as a cruise to Hobart, wasn't it? With, uh, <laughs> until some Englishman interfered and made it a race, I think. Yeah, very <laughs> it was, true. It was originally <laughs> a cruise to Hobart. Well, if you yeah, do yeah. manage to get on board to do that delivery, we're going to have our boat down there for the festival and stuff. So I'll sail out into the Derwent and welcome you coming up <laughs> to Derwent on Solveig if you do it, even though it might not be a race. It'll be nice and that, maybe buy you a beer be, at the end. That would be fantastic. And just, uh, John O, he's a real stickler for the rules. I, I, I had a six-pack of beautiful Cascade Lager ready to chuck over to them. And he said, no, that's outside assistance. We have to wait till we finish the race before we have a beer. I, I wasn't going to protest them, so I don't know what he's talking about. He wasn't going to take that beer to the finish. Uh, uh, funny story. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic, Ed. That's great. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And I'm sure that the people watching this will have enjoyed your comments. Um, I'll put it all together and put in a few photos of some of your boats over the top of it and uh, hopefully we'll make a nice story for people to hear about. So thank you very much for your time. Oh, that's good. Thank you. I, I, I think your organisation is doing fantastic stuff. I always read the emails with interest and, yes, I'm in fantastic plastic boats, but I haven't forgotten my roots and that's, that's wooden boats. Always very important. Lovely. Thanks a lot. I'll speak soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.